bring a few moments for prayer. Let us bow our heads. And while we are have our heads bowed, I want each of you to pray especially for a a sister that's been brought here from the hospital near death. And ask God to be merciful at this time. Maybe we can find favor with him now for her. Lord, thou art God. You were God before there was a world. And when there is no world, you will still remain God. And we come to thee to confess all of our faults and our sins and our errors, asking that you forgive us and to cleanse our heart and minds from any shadow of unbelief. And let thy spirit come so near at this time that you would heal this dear sick woman that we are praying so sincerely for. Only you alone, Lord, can do this. And let it be so, Lord. We love you. And we, are, we, we say as the boy's father, help thou our unbelief, Lord. That we might be strengthened at this hour for this prayer. That it might go to thee and so much that it would touch the hem of thy garment. May turning you speak to her and let her live for the kingdom of God's sake. And we pray for others who are in divine presence and those who are in the presence in the radio land. Let thy healing spirit be upon them. And forgive us of our sins and all of our trespasses and Give us of thy word tonight that we might feast upon it, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are starting in a new week here at the Angelus Temple. And trusting that we have favor with Almighty God to continue on. Uh, Billy was telling me that there has been many people in the building who has prayer cards. Uh, I probably some nights didn't take them up. And there was uh, several of you having prayer cards and some from other meetings that still carrying prayer cards from former meetings. I thought tomorrow night, if the Lord willing, you who know is holding prayer cards, we'll take up all the prayer cards tomorrow night in a prayer line, starting prayer service tomorrow night for the sick. And we appreciate if you'll tell the people who, who hasn't uh, been in the prayer line yet and have a prayer card that they will be here tomorrow night for prayer service for the sick. Usually I don't run every night in the prayer line because of uh, uh, the discernment like it has such a, a, an effect upon me of weakening and I have several meetings if it's just this one it would be different but I go from this to another and to another and overseas and, and when I left home I think there was around 400 major cities in the United States calling now for meetings. And just here in the United States, besides practically every nation under the heavens, Africa, India, Australia, New Zealand, Siam, the islands, Europe, Asia, everywhere, just calling, begging, signing petitions, and, and officials of the city signing for meetings. And my greatest ministry is overseas. But I don't want to go over there asking the peoples uh, to pay my way in things. I go along here, and just as the people give to me, I save it as much as I can till I accumulate enough to go over so I can pay my own way with the American money to those poor people who doesn't have enough to eat. 
I know missionaries tonight that's preaching the gospel in the jungles on two meals a week with no shoes on their feet. Now, how could you expect me to live in luxury and such as that going on? Why, they'll stand in the day of judgment and condemn us for the things that we have. And yet we should divide. I keep my meetings little, as you see. I don't have no broadcast or no uh, television programs and nothing big. I, I keep it small so I can uh, work every penny of money I can over to the, the fields and do all that I can. My expenses are pretty heavy. My, at my office there, we take in thousands of letters and got four phones and they're going, I've seen the time at as many as 64 long distant calls an hour, 24 hours around. And so you can see sick and afflicted calling, and that's, that's it, national and international. I just got through calling Germany, listening to Germany this afternoon. And from different parts of the world, they call. And my expenses runs me at home about $150 a day just for my offices and things at home. And then I have about 10 different offices across the country where I have to have my mail translated and sent back into the fields again. You see where Germany and Switzerland and Finnish and uh, all different languages that we have to have somebody to translate it to send it back. So pray for me. And I... Uh, Come some rough miles, and I, I'm sure I got some rough ahead of me. So just keep praying and looking up, believing. Now, tomorrow night we're going to start a series of subject. I'm going to start tomorrow night on Genesis, the twelfth chapter, and run Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday on building and teaching faith, just to follow our dear brother Duplice's morning service. Um, building faith on the life of Abraham and try to run three nights a series of subjects on Abraham's faith. Tomorrow afternoon at 2.30, I'm at the Pisgah uh, home, church. I believe it's on 60th Street or somewhere. I'm mistaken probably not. I don't know the city too well. They have to come get me. That's tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. And tomorrow night, back here to begin this series of subject. Now, tonight, I thought maybe we would have a little short subject and, and see what the Lord would have us do. I wish you to turn tonight to Psalm 63, if you would like to read behind me as I read. I think the reading of the Word is grand. <laughs> Because no sub service is complete without first reading God's Word. Now, He never promised to bless my Word, but He did promise to bless His own Word. So, my Word will fail. His Word will never fail. So, therefore, I think each night, if we can read just a little verse or two out of His Word, it makes me feel that maybe the if the Holy Spirit doesn't get a hold of what I'm trying to say, he's already said it anyhow in what I read. So it would be worthwhile. O Lord, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsts for Thee, my flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, as I have seen thee in thy sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better to me than life, my shall praise thee. When I first read this uh, piece of scripture, I began to wonder what must David be talking about? It kind of, that's what got me to thinking when the greatest thing I believe that anyone could have would be life. I cannot think of anything any greater than life. 
That's why we preach and try so hard to express you must be born again. This life must be changed. I got a letter today, and perhaps a person is present, from a young colored lady, very seemingly by her letter, very highly educated woman, that came to the meeting, and she asked me not to express or to say this doctor's name because I understand. Certainly it would just cause other doctors to call this fellow and criticize and so forth. But the young woman had been examined and there were two great big places in her side. And she, being a Presbyterian by faith, she just never thought too much about divine healing, but those two large growths, way larger than grapefruits, had turned to be malignant. And it was so advanced, the doctor said there was no way for an operation. That there, it couldn't be saved somehow from the x-rays or whatever they had done. It showed the, the advancement of the, the two places and it, her sides were so sore she couldn't even stand her clothes on them hardly. And so she came to the church and she had heard, you know, faith cometh by hearing. And she knew she was dying. So she came to the church and said, I read the scripture. I'll try to quote it just as close as I can. And maybe tomorrow night, if you think, I'll bring the letter and not read the woman's name, but show you. And she said that she, um, when I was reading the scriptures, she said, Oh, Lord, let him turn to me and, and speak to me. And said, I, no more than she had said it. I laid the Bible down and looked at her. But then I didn't speak. And a few moments said, she called again, Oh Lord, let him look at me for if you don't heal me, I must die. My life is ended. And said that, uh, that I turned again and looked. And then said that toward the end of the service, I said, you there with the tumor, stand up for Jesus Christ has made you well. And she said she looked around to see if there was anyone else around her. And said, I said, you with a certain dress or something like that on, stand up for Jesus Christ has healed you. And she goes to her doctor after that. Those two big places went down. And she went to the doctor, and the doctor said, It must have been a perfect operation, for there was no sign of it, none whatever. The, and there's no doubt that the woman is in the building tonight. I got the letter. And, of course, I'm, I don't play upon things like that. I just say that to God's glory. I don't have magazines to publish such and so forth. But I know one thing, the people are being healed. I've got great piles of letters that has come in and phone calls of people that's left this place and this meeting and been healed of serious diseases, that their lives has been spared by the grace of Almighty God. So life is a great thing. We all want to live. And when I hear David speaking here in the Psalms and saying, because thy love kindness is better to me than life, my lips shall praise thee, and I long to see thy power like I have seen it in thy sanctuary. My soul thirsts after thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Now, when I begin to think that, I thought there must be more than one meaning to life because what could be greater than life your life controls you 
Your life makes you what you are. It, it operates your, your motive. And it's, it's just you. And it's, it controls you. If you've got a good heart, good spirit, you have good life. If you have an evil heart, evil thoughts, evil life. Like some years ago, down in the South, they, uh, they used, in the days of slavery, they used to take the human beings and, and sell them, the colored people, as slaves. And they would go to the uh, big plantations and, and they had uh, brokers that would come by and, and buy up these slaves and, and for a certain amount of money and take them and sell them, make profit off of them, just like they do used cars or something today. Think of how evil that was to take human life to which Christ died for and to sell it, make it a slave. God made man, man made slaves. And there was a certain broker came by an old plantation that had many slaves on it. And so the slaves were away from home. They would, they were stole out of Africa and was brought over here and sold. And they know they never go back to the homeland no more. They were sad. They, they didn't want to work. They had no ambition. And so they would sometimes take whips and whip those people to make them work. Just like you would a, a horse or an animal. And this slave buyer came by and he looked over his slaves to see how many he could buy. And he found there was one young fellow there. They didn't have to whip him. He had his chest out, his chin up. He was right up and at it all the time. And so the broker said to the owner, Say, I would like to buy that slave. But the owner said, he's not for sale. Well, I said, uh, what makes him so much different from the rest of the slaves? Said, perhaps maybe uh, he's the boss. You've made him boss over the rest of them. And the owner said, no, I never made him boss. He's just a slave. Well, I said, maybe you feed him better than you feed the rest of the slaves. He said, no, they all eat over there in the galley, all of them together. Then the broker said, what makes this young fella so much different from the rest of them? And the owner said, I wondered about that for some time. But said, you know, one day I found out over in the homeland where they came from, this young fellow's father is a king of the tribe. And though he's an alien and away from home, still he knows he's a king's son. And he conducts himself as a king's son. And I thought if a slave being away from home, knowing that he was a son of a tribal king, how much more ought the children of God to conduct themselves like sons and daughters of God while we're in this alienated world? How we ought to embrace these promises of God, how we ought to cherish those things and hold them dear. It doesn't become a Christian to operate himself around unbelief. A Christian should have his chin up. He should be ready to believe anything that God says. No matter what it is, it'll keep the morale of the rest of them up. It'll, we are sons and daughters of God. 
And we ought to conduct ourselves like that. Some people think that life only lays in how much money you can get while you're here on earth. That's not life. And some of them has lotted it to pleasure. How much big time they can see. What a company they society they can join or what lodge or, or something they can do. They figure that that's life. If you could join the, the 400 or get in the book of who's who. So many people try to get into that book of who's who. I, my name will never be there, but I've got it on a better book, the book of life and glory. For God, and God's who's who. I was born again one day. Then my name was put on God's who's who. And I know that setting before us is a great dark chamber. And every time our heart beats, we get one beat closer to that chamber. And it's called death. And someday it'll take its last beat and I got to go in there. But there's one glorious hope that I have. That this, I know him in the power of his resurrection. That when he calls, I'll come out from among the dead. That great day. I don't want to go like a coward. I want to wrap myself in the robes of his righteousness. Entering in there knowing that I know him as a personal experience and been born again of eternal life. If I never have a friend on earth, I want to know him. If I don't know his word too well, I want to know him. Some time ago there was a, a fellow at Fort Wayne, Indiana said to me, he said, Brother Branham, he was behind the stage at the Fort Wayne Gospel Tabernacle. He said, it's a shame your grammar. I said, I know it's awful. And I said, I didn't get an education. There's ten of us children and dad died and I had to take care of the other nine. And he said, that's no excuse. You're a man now. I said, but I'm so busy praying for the sick people. I don't have a time. He said, the a man that would speak to the audience as you do and use the grammar you do. And he said, last night you said on the pulpit out there, said you said, all you people coming up here to the pulpit. He said, those people appreciate you more if you'd say pulpit. I said, brother, I don't believe that. Them people don't care whether I say pulpit or pulpit. So I live the life and preach the gospel and produce what God talks about in the power of His resurrection. That's what people are looking for, honest-hearted people. Just life. Some time ago I was in a large city in another nation and we'd had a great meeting at a big ice arena and that night when I was going into the hotel there was a certain lodge in America here was having their big convention up there at this hotel and that afternoon I never seen so many drunk people in my life hardly at one time and so then when that night when I come home, there was just whiskey bottles all over everything. And they were just having themselves what they called a big time. It's too bad that America has sold out to such stuff as that. And it's the worst in the world. Now, I've just about traveled the world over. Been in many nations several times. But the world, I believe they need missionaries worse than anywhere else in the world is the USA. That's exactly right. An educated heathen is harder to deal with than one that has no education. Because he thinks he knows everything when he knows nothing. 
I don't mean to be rude, but I want to be honest. It's the truth. In Puerto Rico, a few days ago, we were staying at, I was, at about a fourth-class hotel. Because I don't believe that a Christian should have everything swanky. Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head, and yet we have to drive Cadillacs to be spiritual. Why, there's something wrong. And there was an old man there that kind of hangs around with the Christian businessman. I don't know just what his name was. And we were over to another great hotel. Oh, it was a mammoth and a beautiful place. Hundreds of dollars to stay in that thing a week. And the old fellow's about 80 years old, a retired railroader. And there was the Puerto Rican people, normally looking people, dressed here come the Americans in half-dressed, naked, half-drunk, staggering. The old man looked around me and said, Prices are higher over here, but life is lower. And that's just about the answer. It's a disgrace sometimes the way that get into another country and see the way these people act that come from this country. As much as you've had the gospel preached to them and then act like that while you receive double damnation at the day of judgment. Why, it's a shame. I got on the elevator that night, and the whiskey bottles all on there, and I said to the little fella, I said, looks like the, the glass company had a, a sure a big day. He said, i never seen such in my life. I said, I don't want to say anything about it because you're an American. I said, yes, but sometime action like that makes me ashamed of it. So he stopped up on a certain floor and let me out. And when I got out of the elevator and started towards my room, I heard somebody whooping and hollering. And I looked coming down to the room, the hall, and here come two young women, perhaps mothers, both had wedding rings on. They looked to be in their late twenties, and they just had on one little underneath garment with a bottle of whiskey in their hand. And man so drunk trying to get out and grab these women, them pulling and falling. And I got back into a little place and kind of stopped for a few minutes. It made me so ashamed. And I seen them coming through there, and they stopped right out in front of me. And one of them took the bottle and took a great big drink and handed it to the other and pulled up that little underneath skirt and threw her foot out and hollered, Whoopee, this is life. I walked out in the middle of the floor and caught them both by their hand. That's why I know they had wedding rings on. Perhaps a husband home somewhere babysitting. And it's just as bad with the man. Sin is sin on either side. And it's all corruption. Oh, just having a little clean fun, they said. Clean fun. That's sin. God will make you pay for it. God will make the nation pay for it. It will make the individuals pay for it. We sell people whiskey and stuff and cigarettes and giving them cancer and telling them this, that, and the other. And then we wonder, what's the matter? And here they come, and I help their hands like that, and... And I said, I beg your pardon. You said, this is life. I said, this is death. It's only death dressed up. It's true. And this girl looked around and said, well, we don't mean no harm. I was trying to hold her up. I said, looky here. I am. said, won't you take a drink? I said, I am a preacher, a gospel preacher. Then they started jerking back. I said, kneel with me here in the floor just a minute. You sober up and go home to your children. They jerked away and down through the hall. They went falling over one another. Not fit to be in their own home with the shades pulled down the way they were dressed. And then they called that life. That's death certainly is. And the world is so crowded down today, calling 
big times and you got so much of it out here on this West Coast. So much glamour. And I've noticed it's creeped into the churches. Trying to glamour the church. The church is not glamour. It's a place to preach righteousness, holiness and purity and the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit in the human life. Oh, it's a disgrace. What makes a person do that? Why? Is this... And then if Satan can't blindfold you to do that, he'll do something else for you. He'll let you feel that you want to be religious. And then he'll let you go over and shake hands with a minister somewhere and put your name on a book and think that you're religious. I said to a young girl one time, coming on the platform, I said, Are you a Christian? Why, she felt stepped on. She said, I'll give you to understand I belong to such and such a church. I said, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Not a thing. One said, asked him one time, Brother Bosworth asked the young girl, I heard him on the platform, said, are you a Christian? She said, I'll give you to understand I burn a candle every night. Like that's got anything to do with it. To be a Christian means to be Christ-like. Born of His Spirit, cleansed by the Holy Ghost and fire, a new creature created in the, the likeness and the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. What makes people want to do that is because it's their makeup. They can't help it. God made them to thirst. He made a man when he made up the man, he made him to thirst. But he made him put that thirst in him to thirst after God. And how dare any man or woman to try to satisfy that holy thirst in them with the things of the world. You've got no right to do it. God made you to thirst for him. And you'll never be satisfied until you drink from that fountain that's filled with blood gone from Emmanuel's veins where sinners plunge beneath the flood and lose all their guilty stain. You just can't satisfy yourself. You go out and get drunk and you come back and you have a headache the next morning. You get up and you start and the next day... Throw it in again. So nervous you can't hold yourself together. Smoke one cigarette after the other. And knowing not that you're heaping coals of fire into it. Why, ever one you smoke will make you that much more nervous. And what does, a, what does that? It's the devil. God's the one can quieten your nerves. God's the one who can give you that satisfying potion. That's His Spirit. The reason that you do those things is because you're substituting those things for the real thirst that God put in you for the Holy Ghost. Oh, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. He's the fountain of life. My expression of Jesus Christ, He is the inexhaustible fountain of life. That a man may drink and be satisfied. That's what you're made like that for. That's why you got that thirst in you. And then if he can't make you drink, and the doctors can scare you to death of cancer in the throat from cigarette, then he'll let you join a church. And just go ahead living for the world. He's still got you. You're still not satisfied. There cannot be a satisfaction outside of the new birth. A man was made for that. God made you up that way. And now you'll never be satisfied until you quench that thirsting with the Holy Spirit. 
When you take one drink from that fountain, you become a new creature. Old desires pass away. All things become new to you. Then that satisfying potion of the baby like laying on its mama's breast. It's drawing from her its life. That's the way Jesus is. That potion is Him. The Christian has no right to brag on what denomination of church you belong to and try to call it satisfied. My mother was a certain certain and I, I'm that too. That doesn't have nothing to do with it. And no one has any right to try to satisfy that holy thirst and hunger in their soul with the things of the world. You're only perverting the very gracious thing that God put in you. God made you to thirst so you would thirst after Him. And you pervert that and listen to the devil and thirst and try to satisfy that thirst with the things of the world. Jesus said, or the Bible said, if ye love the world are the things of the world, the love of God's not even in you. See how short we are today? See how why people tonight can be a church member and stay home in the time of a revival to watch a television program. They'll they'll stay home to watch a carnival or to hear a political speech or something. It's because they are thirsting, but they're trying to satisfy that thirst with the things of the world. If you just open up that heart one time to God, David said in another psalm, he said, as a heart thirsts after the water brook, so my soul thirsts after thee, O God. No wonder we can come to a meeting, see the manifestations of the power of God, and then go away and say, oh, well, there was nothing to it. Mama used to tell me you can't get blood out of a turnip. If God's Spirit's in you and you see God's Word fulfilled, it'll make you rejoice. Something has to move. When Jesus came into the city, He said, If they hold their peace, the rocks will immediately cry out. Something has to move when the Spirit of God comes riding in. David was a woodsman. He knew what the woods was. He knew how, how the animals. Oh, I hear him write of the shady green pastures and the still waters. He could appreciate it because there he found God. Who could look at a flower and say there's no God? Did you ever notice how this little seed comes up in the spring? A pretty little blossom comes on it. And after a while, frost hits it. It dies, bows its little head. And then God has a funeral procession for His flowers. I don't know whether you know that or not. But He does. The fall rains come and cry tears down out the sky. And it buries that little seed. The cold winter comes in my country and freezes that ground for maybe a foot deep. That little seed freezes, the pulp runs out of the little seed, the petal's gone, the flower's gone, the bulb's gone, the seed's gone, the pulp's gone. But just let that sun start rising in the springtime again. That little flower will live again. Certainly, and if God made a way for a flower to live again, how much more has He made a way for a man in His own image to live again? David studied nature and his heart long. And one day or so, crying out for God, he said, as the heart painteth for the water brook, my soul thirst after thee, O God. I'm a hunter, and I suppose I'm talking to many of them. And anyone knows if you ever shoot a deer and wound him, 
If that deer can get to water, you'll never catch that deer. He's, he'll drink water, go up over the hill, come back, drink water, go up over the hill. That cold water will stop his bleeding. And you'll never catch him. And David had been noticing in the country that he lived in, like in Africa, they have wild dogs. And these wild dogs are something like our wolf. And they have two blood fangs that hangs down over the sides of their mouth. And they're very cunning in their catching of deer, just like the devil. And usually they see the deer, and if one little deer will wander off to himself, that's a real place to get one. That's what I think about sometimes God's little deers sometimes wander off from the foal. There might be some here tonight that's wandered away from the protection of the church and the protection of the loved ones who'd pray for you and help you to come back to God. Keep you straight. Come to the church and listen to the gospel. There may be some in Radio Land that's wandered away. And then you watch these killer dogs, hounds. They start slipping up real easy, like a cat. And they go a little piece, and there's something about it that those deer can almost sense that there's something wrong. They raise their little head. They get nervous. There's not a person in my hearing tonight. There's not a backslider. What knows it since you left the fold of God that you've been nervous and upset? There's something wrong. A many a little girl listening in tonight. That's had a good mama, a daddy that's tried to teach her right. She's out in some dive somewhere, or away from God, and there she's trying to satisfy that. Thirst in her heart was some of this modern teenage rock and roll, which is of the devil. And that's for some of you preachers that lets it be preached in your churches, too. Any church that gets low enough to have to entertain their young folks by rock and roll, change the sign on the front of your door. Not a house of God. Just recently, I was in a place and uh, I was in a hotel and the the YM or YWCA was across from me. Well, I had to close the window blinds and pull them down to study the gospel for the teachers teaching rock and roll. And this old bluggly woogly air, what you call the stuff. It's a shame. What does that C stand for? It's supposed to stand for Christ. Trying to satisfy yourself. With that kind of a stuff. When it's of the devil and will damn your soul. Certainly a real born again Christian won't do them kind of things. It's true. And so these wolves get up close to where these sheep are. And many of you little ladies out here tonight listen to that, what they call the wolf call. You know, they have a, a whistle. And you think you're smart. Little lady, you don't realize what danger you're in. And they get real close and they watch the deer till they get a chance. And that's all a boy that would squeal like that and whistle and holler at girls on the streets not fit for a decent girl to go with. And that's a great big mouthful, but I'd rather be honest here and be condemned at the judgment. I'm going to Tell the truth. That's all I know is to tell the truth. What the church needs tonight is back to the gospel, back to the old-fashioned gospel, back to the saving knowledge and that thirst. If you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, you wouldn't be out there in those kind of places. It's so sweet to trust Him and believe Him. He's a satisfying potion. He's your life. And those big old wolves or dogs, when they see the deer, now they've got a technique in doing it. 
And they get just as close as they can. And then they run and take those fangs and throw them in the deer's neck right behind the burr of the ear. And then they swing their weight. And those great big fangs like lances, when the wolf's weight comes down, this cuts the little fellow's throat. He makes a few jumps and he's finished. Then that's all of it. And a few minutes is covered over with dogs. Just tearing it to pieces. Just chunk after chunk tearing it out. Listen, sister and brother. I didn't mean you young folks to hurt your feelings. You want to talk about what you call your pleasures. I don't want to hurt you. I love you. But little sis, you are a little virgin and never been out in these parties. Just let it get started one time and the hounds of hell will cover you over. They'll pick every moral thing there is about you away from you. You'll be nothing but a, no matter how much you repent and how bad you try to get right, that mark will follow you to your grave. Stay away from them. Get out of it. God's got something for you to thirst after. That's Him. He'll give us satisfaction. Those things will be so dead you won't even hear them. Now sometimes the dog misses the deer's throat. Then he's got another place to catch the little deer. And that is in the flank. Now the flank is the middle or balanced part of the deer. The hind quarters are heavier than the front quarters and with the loin throat in neck and so forth, makes it about balanced up. Then if the dog or wolf can catch it in the flank and start swinging it, he'll soon throw the deer down. And the same thing happens. It's covered over with dogs in a few minutes, just picking it to pieces. But when this lead dog, the one that's the leader of the pack, that most popular rock or roller, you know what I'm talking about. If he can only get the hope. Now, if he ever grabs, if that deer's real smart and know how to get out of there, she'll give a little quick jerk to one side and her little tender body will let that dog's mouth pull this whole chunk of flesh out. If it's quick and can maneuver quick. All my advice is to you, sister, brother. If he's grabbed you, maneuver quick, jump towards heaven as hard as you can. Get away from it. Pull out. Don't have nothing else to do with it. Get away from it quickly. If you're fixing to put your first cigarette in your mouth tonight, or take the first drink, or go to the first rock and roll party, or tell mama the first lie, get away from it. It's a devil. And then, when he jerks out, the blood flies. And if the little deer's real fast on foot, which they are faster than the dog, it can run for what life it's got until it gets away from the pack. Over the hills, jumping through the places where the dog has to travel through the bushes, it just leaps right over the top of the bushes, running just as hard as it can run. And then after it's got away from the dog, maybe there's some listening to me tonight. That's done that. Just, just got away from it. What are you going to do? What's the trouble? You see that little deer? I've watched them many times. They put their little head up in the air and they're just painting. They just got to find water. They just got to find it. They're bleeding. They're dying. Every time their heart beats, the blood pushes right out of them. That chunks out of their side. And if they don't find water, they'll die right away. And you can imagine the sincerity and the honesty of that deer. He'll run to the top of the hill. He'll look, painting. He'll look somewhere else, just painting as hard as he can. He's got his nose up. He, he's smelling for water. He's got to find water or he'll perish. Brother, if this Angelus Temple... If these people are here tonight would thirst after God like that, there'd be a revival breakthrough here in a few minutes that would sweep the country over. As the heart painteth for the water brook, my soul thirst after thee, O God. When you get to a place, you've got to have him or die. 
You can't go on without him. He's your life. You must have him. He's, you're just about finished. And you're looking, trying. Jesus said, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. <laughs> filled with what? Not creeds. Not denominations. Not amusements of the world. But filled with the Holy Ghost. Which is our satisfying potion. That gives us that life. That satisfies the God of heavens in this building tonight. The God that created the heavens and earth is here tonight. That's what makes him God to me. He had the highest place in heaven and took the lowest place on earth. He come from the highest heaven and went to the lowest hell. He become you that you who through his grace might become him. Sons and daughters of God. And he's in the building tonight. Night after night, he represents himself. The church has been preached to death. People come usually to the church. They say, well, we'll go to this go because it's a duty sometimes. Sometimes they go because there's certain ministers, great man in the land today that can really bring out a sermon. They go to hear that. But what we really ought to go to church was, was to find Christ. Yes, go to church to worship so you can expel all your guilt and shame and throw all the world and its gloom out of your heart and let Christ come in, God's satisfying potion. Then you'll have eternal life. His Spirit is here. His Spirit wants to move in this church. Let us bow our heads. says if one speaks with tongues then there be an interpreter see if there's no interpreter then it's just with nothing but if there be an interpreter then that's God speaking an, a voice to the church how thankful we are for the kingdom of God now the Lord Jesus is here I want our sister to get ready for the organ here for just a few words There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. While she's carting it, and you in radio land, I wish you could be here in this Angelus temple to feel that settling down, that awe, the Spirit of God. Think of it out there. Then the Bible said, if one comes in unlearned and someone speaks with tongues and there's no interpreter, he'll think you're barbarians or so forth. But if one prophesies and reveals the secret of the heart, then all of them will fall down and say, truly, God is with you. God is in our building. God is in our midst tonight. God is in his holy temple. He's trying to urge you to come to him. Don't be satisfied with being a Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or whatever you might be. That, that's all right. I, them denominations are fine. See, I respect every one of them. Every denomination. I, 
I send people back to their home church. That it isn't the denomination I'm kicking against. It's how worldly we've gotten in here. See? Come be a Christian, then go to any church of your choice. That's the thing, is be a Christian is what we're talking about. If you like the Baptist church, go to the Baptist church. Be born again in the Baptist church. If you're Catholic, be born again and be in the Catholic church. Presbyterian, do the same thing. But first, before you go back, get the Holy Ghost. Be born again. And you'll be an enlightenment. You'll help others to come. If you just believe it. Scriptures, right? That would be the Holy Spirit speaking. Just the same as this is here. Little lady sitting there wiping her face right there. She's got heart trouble. Yes, you believe the Lord wants, will heal you now, sister? Sitting there on the end of the row right down here with heart trouble. You believe that God will heal you? If you can believe it with all of your heart, God will do it for you. The lady sitting back there praying for her loved one. It's real nervous sitting right back there. Do you believe God would heal that loved one? The Bible said, if thou canst believe all things are possible do you believe it complications sitting to the left of that post there if you believe it with all your heart God will grant it to you God is God do you believe that right down here at the glasses on lady sitting with that trouble with her head do you believe that God will heal you sister or right. no, sitting right here she's got a that on glasses, gray in the front. Looking right here. You believe God will heal you, sister? Yes, you just raise your, raise your hand up there. That's you. No, the lady right back there. You, you don't have it now. It's left you. It's gone from you. Amen. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe. Do you believe it? The Bible said, if you can believe Oh, he's so real. This minister sitting right down here, wondering, scared about cancer. If you just have faith and believe, you won't have that cancer. If thou canst believe. That is, if you can believe it. Sitting way back here, there's another minister sitting there. He's got his wife and child. The child's got... Asthma, his wife's up for an operation. That's right. That's you raising your hand, you're right. Put your hand over on the child. The child and mother and father put your hands together on one another. Oh Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, let it be known this night that you're God. I pray that you'll heal them. Grant it, Lord. There is your spirit making itself known to us. Grant this healing of all the people. Now may they be physically healed and spiritually healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There is a fountain filled with blood. There is a fountain filled Drawn from Emmanuel vein and sinners plunged beneath the flood.
Bow your heads now reverently, quietly. Think it over. Sinner friend, while you have your head bowed. And you out in Radio Land also, would you just stop and pause a minute in this hustling bustle of life? Do you realize that you may not be among the living in the morning? And if you don't possess this eternal life, you're lost. Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot even see the kingdom of God. Come, sinner friend, out in Radio Land and receive him just now as your personal Savior. Won't you do it? Bow right in the room where you are. Or don't make any difference who's around you. Don't be ashamed of him. He won't be ashamed of you on that day. Just kneel right down wherever you are. Dad, you and mother there that maybe hasn't raised your children the way you should. Maybe that's the reason they're out in the world tonight. Why don't you just go over where mother is now and put your arm around her and say, Dear, it's true. We've been, as a prodigal, wasting our substance with riotous living. We can never be satisfied like this. Let's come to Christ tonight. Do that, won't you, friend, out in Radio Land? And to you here in this visible audience, how many of you say, Brother Branham, remember me in prayer. I want to consecrate myself to God. Raise up your hand all over the building everywhere. My, my. Is there a sinner or a backslider here that has felt the snarl of the wolf, the bite of his fangs, would like to come right down here and stand here while we offer prayer? It just seems like a little thing, but it's a great thing. I'd like for you to come down here, like come down and shake your hand. You sinner friends, come right down here. Let me walk down and pray with you here, will you? God bless you, lady. Walk right over here. That's good. One soul worth 10,000 worlds. While we sing now, ever sinner come. There is a fountain. Come on down. Come down, son. God bless you, son. God bless you, sir. That's the way. Emmanuel's vein and sin. There's plenty. That's right, ladies. Come right on. Are you thirsting? You're trying to find something to satisfy? That's good. Come right on down. That's good. Lose all their guilty stain. Lose all. Come on, sinner friend, right out of the balconies. Come right down along the sides like this. Like to shake your hand as you pass this platform here. Now, sinners plunge beneath the flood. Look all their guilty stain. The dying thief rejoice to come sinner and backslider. Won't you come down now and kneel at the altar? Come right. There great group of them has knelt around the altar here since we made the call to you in Radio Land. Men, women, young and old. While as he washed all my sin away. Now, while she's carding that song again, I wonder tonight, I really feel that there should be more than this. We're very grateful for these sinners that's knelt here at the altar, they're tired of trying to satisfy themselves with just a little old uh, something other the world. They're sick of it. They're, they're just all washed up as a worldly expression, but they're just finished with it. They want something real. They're going to receive it. The very God that knows your heart knows that that's true. God bless you, lady. That's right. Come right on down there. Won't you come? Now, there may be church members in here that belongs to some churches here in Los Angeles, other places. You've been here this week and last week, 
and watch the Holy Spirit move. Now, that's the very thing that's telling me in my heart now that you need to come down here. Won't you come? God bless you, lady. God bless you. That's right. Come right on out. Move right out of the audience and come down here. How I'm waiting, holding off just a little while longer. Well, who would raise up their hand and say, Brother Branham, I know I'm wrong. Pray for me to have courage enough to come. We don't believe in going back and getting people now. I don't do that. If the Holy Spirit can't convince you enough that you're wrong to come down here and be right. Now, what if just now you feel something moving, this temple will go to falling in, or an earthquake had struck the city, or a bomb had struck somewhere, and it's just turning to powder. You're going to be gone. What would you do? Are you all ready to go? God bless you, lady. God bless you, sir. That's right. God bless you. The whole family coming. That's good. Come. That's right. God bless you, lady. Come right on down now to the altar. Listen, it's the most gallant thing that you ever done was to come to Christ. If you're not sure you're right with God, don't wait too long. There's going to be a resurrection one of these days. And Jesus is coming. I, you say, I've heard that for a long time, Brother Branham. But this may be the last time you ever hear it. Remember, this may be the end of the time for you tonight. You may never have an opportunity. Before morning, you may be pressing a dying pillow and the veins cooling off in your arms. Come, that's right. That's right. Come right out. That's good. You say, Brother Branham, you're scaring the people. No, I'm not. I'm telling you the truth. You've got to meet God. You're going to either meet Him here or meet Him at the judgment in His anger. You're meeting Him here while He's pleading to you. You meet Him then, He's your judge. Now He's your Savior. Won't you come while we sing one more verse? And you that of church members, we're not asking you to join the Angelus Temple. We'd love to have you here. That's true enough. We've got wonderful church people here and fine pastors and, and so forth, a nice building and it's uh, uh, just a wonderful church. We love to have you here. But if you don't want, if you want to go back to your own church, we don't want you to leave your church. We just want you to come and be sure that you're right with God. See, that's that's the thing we're trying to do is you to be right. The hour is coming, and now is that when we can't play church no more. It's God working in the church. We must have it. If your soul is thirsting for something and you've been trying to satisfy it on a creed, try to satisfy it on something else, leave that tonight and come down here, won't you? Come down now while we sing again. All right, all together. In a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy Won't you come out? Come right on. Now, I invite you. Remember, the next time you hear my voice, maybe at the judgment. Remember, I've offered you Jesus. If you wonder how these things are done, the interpretation of the Spirit, how it discerns Spirit, come on. Come in to God now. Fill your heart with it. How many in here... How many in here wants to make a consecration to God? Raise your hand. Say, I just love to come up a little closer to God. Now you come down. Come right down. All of you that wants to reconsecrate yourself, to feel God's Spirit in your life more, greater. Maybe you're seeking the Holy Spirit. You've already come and confessed your faith, but you want to receive the Holy Spirit. Want to rededicate yourself. We're wanting a revival to continue on. Come right on down now, will you? Come right down around the front here. That's fine. Oh, that's fine. Coming from everywhere, young and old alike, moving right down. Radio Land, uh, you should be here to look at this. Just people coming down every aisle. Watching the sincerity, some crying. Oh, this is what I love. To see people coming to worship my Lord. See people, men and women, who are thirsting for righteousness. Blessed are ye when you do hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you shall be filled. There is that fountain filled with blood right now. If you're not just where you ought to be, you Pentecostal, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever you are, come right now, won't you? That's right. Come with the rest of them. You won't be by yourself. There's just... Packed all up and down here now. Around the altars are full and the 
seats around, it's full, and they're still coming down. Just keep coming. Keep coming right on down. Don't let the hounds of hell sap your precious life. If you jerk far enough to get away from him, he'll catch up with you again. Don't you let him do that. The old poison things in you. Find the water. Find the water, the water of life. Jesus is that water of life. Come right on down. That's it. Now let all the personal workers gather right around these people. Each one in here that's a personal worker, gather right around these people. Now we're going to have prayer. That's good. That's fine. Come right on. Now, my friend, I want to tell you something. You here in the visible audience and you in Radio Land, this is one of the greatest times of my life. The rest of you may be seated for a moment, if you will. When I was just a young preacher, there was a, a young lady asked me if, if I would go to a dance with her. She was a, a preacher's sister. I told her, no. She said, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't go to dances. Where do you have any pleasure? I was holding a tent meeting. The next night, there's an altar call about like this, people gathering around. I motioned to her. She come up where I was. I said, sister, this is more pleasure to me than all the things of the world is to see sinners coming, kneeling, bowing, concentrating their life unto God. Deep consecration. That's what I like to see. Surrendering your lives. Now, each one of you here at the altar, you are, and out in Radio Land, you bow now for prayer too. There might not be a personal worker out there in Radio Land, but there's a Holy Spirit there. He's the one to direct you. Now, each one, pray in your own way, confess your wrong, and ask God to be merciful to you, and He'll certainly do it. Now, with your heads bowed everywhere... I'm going to ask Brother Duffield to walk up here and ask the prayer for you in Radio Land and for you here at the altar. God bless you now. While all bow your head and let's all pray for these people that's at the altar. While we have our heads bowed everywhere, I'll be ready in Radio Land to accept Christ while our brother leads us in prayer. Praise the Lord.